Jay Powell is probably not a Volcker, but he's treading a similar path. But the Fed is going to try and break the system. That, that's, what it's, uh, that's, what it, it's, that's what it typically does. It needs to get inflation down. It can't act on supply. It can only act on demand. And that's what it's focused on. And I'm absolutely sure you're going to get a, a recession in the US. But believe me, the recession in the rest of the world may well be a lot worse. Hey, this is Jared Dillian, editor of the Daily Dirt Nap. I'm here with Dr. Michael Howell of Cross Border Capital. Today is Monday, June 13th. People are already calling it Black Monday, although I think that's hyperventilating a little bit. But uh, Michael, thanks for thanks for talking with me today. Jared, great pleasure to see you. Thank you. Uh, well, there's a lot going on. Uh, you know, we had a chat over the weekend. Things are different than they were 48 hours ago. So what's your general take of uh, this madness that's going on right now? Well, I, I don't know if it's madness. It's madness in the markets, but it's basically a response to uh, what central banks are doing. The Fed has got the, uh, the bit between its teeth. It wants to get rid of inflation. Uh, after the print on Friday, it looks like they're going to front load more, or that will be the expectation. Um, the next six months are going to be pretty ugly. Um, our, our call has been for the US market at least to fall by about 30% from peak to trough. I think that's pretty much on track. Uh, other world economies are already in recession. Um, US economy is probably about a month away, uh, maybe if that. Um, you know, the, uh, the Michigan survey came out on Friday was very ugly. Um, I think things are going to get worse. Inflation is not the friend of the markets. It's not the friend of the Federal Reserve. Federal Reserve is squeezing hard, and I think the the bottom line is that the Fed or the Treasury's uh, combined policy is one of getting the balance sheet down and getting the U.S. dollar up, and that's not uh, happy news for the world economy. Well, if you look at the communication of the Fed over the last, um, by the way, that was a terrific summary. I mean, that was that was fantastic. Um, if if you if you look at the communication of the Fed over the last six months. They've really had this ethos of trying to thread the needle, which is to take some of the froth out of the market, bring down asset prices, uh, make some progress on inflation. That was the language that they used. They wanted to see progress on inflation, but they did not want to cause a recession. But it looks like that's what's going to happen. Now, at the Fed, do you believe that Jerome Powell or any of the other Fed governors, you know, do you believe that they see a recession in our future? Do you think that they'll slow down or pause rate hikes or do anything to offset that? Uh, No, I think in short. Um, To use your analogy, they're they're using a needle. They're not threading the needle. They're using the needle to to prick the bubble, to burst the bubble. And... uh, uh, Central bankers don't normally worry about stock markets. They worry about fixed income markets, and they worry about credit markets. We haven't yet seen a lot of damage in the credit markets, but it's probably coming. Uh, when that comes, the Federal Reserve will likely rethink, as it normally does. But uh, you know, I wouldn't expect the Federal Reserve to, uh, to turn around uh, much before the early part of 2023. So we've got a lot of months yet. Uh, I mean, there will be a turn. That's the optimistic news. The bad news is that we could be you know, 12 months away from a serious market upturn. Uh, and that's uh, for a lot of investors going to be a very, very painful period. And um, you know what we look at is fundamentally liquidity, and we look at global liquidity. And this is a, a number that everyone's got to pay attention to. It's a pool of cash which is about 175 trillion dollars. It's uh, almost twice the size of uh, of world GDP, um, and it's increasingly dominated by two uh, two countries: the U.S. on one side and China on the other. And what we've got to try and understand is what are those two central, what are the two central banks that rule those liquidity pools doing? The Federal Reserve is very clearly tightening. Uh, that make no mistake about that. They're shrinking their balance sheet very sharply. And if you look at the evidence, uh, and there's chance that we can we can demonstrate this, you look at the track of the S and P 500 against Federal Reserve liquidity injections. It's this moving one one for one. I mean, this is absolutely in step. And if you believe what the Federal Reserve is saying, that they're going to get uh, another $2 trillion out of their balance sheet to drop it down towards $6 trillion, you're looking at an S&P 500, SPX, 3200 If they make an error, which is entirely possible because central banks are only human, and one of the errors they could make is to uh, basically miss a spike in reverse repos, look at the size of the reverse repo uh, tranche on the Fed's balance sheet, 
So already 2.4 trillion, it could easily get through three. That would actually tell you they're taking three trillion out of the balance sheet. Think about S and P 2,500. Uh, that's bad. On the other side, the Chinese are tightening too. Uh, yeah, this is not a happy situation. I haven't even gone to Japan or uh, Eurozone yet, <laughs> and that looks even worse. Interesting. Well, the, at the beginning of your response, you said that the Fed doesn't care about the stock market, that central banks generally don't, that they care about the credit markets in the fixed income markets. I read some stuff over the weekend that said that the uh, the MBS market is not functioning very well right now. It's functioning poorly. Um, you know, the average 30-year fixed mortgage rate printed at 5.8% on Friday. Do you think that's a concern? I think it probably is a concern. I mean, that's more the area that the Fed will be worried about. But I mean, the, the issue at the end of the day, which is what... Uh, Politicians are saying everywhere, which consensus opinion is saying, is inflation is really the bogey we've got to get rid of. And this is true not just in the States, it's true across the world. I mean, you you start thinking about what German inflation is right now. I mean, these are numbers. These are eye-watering numbers. I mean, no one in Germany would have, if you'd have said that inflation is going to be near 10% in Germany, which is historically a low inflation economy, two years ago, people would have thought, figured you're from Mars or you're crazy. But hey, we've got it. Uh, and you know what the uh, what the Bund market and I watch the Bund market closely because it's it's not behaving well. What the Bund market in Germany is telling you is that the ECB have lost control of inflation, or that's what the market's fearing. So you know these are big big issues that we've all got to face. And if the Bund sells off, the Treasury is going to you know face a face a headwind here. So one of the things I focus on in my work is sort of the how politics affect the Fed and central banks. Um, I mean, the Fed did not really begin to act on inflation until inflation became a political concern. Like they, right. they, they postponed acting for a really long time up until inflation got to be about 6%. Then it became a political concern and then they acted on it. But the other thing that the Fed cares about a lot is unemployment, job losses, so, you know, what you've seen in the last four or five weeks is jobless claims are starting to tick up uh, just a little bit. And, you know, the claims number is really the only number that's a raw number. It doesn't have any revisions. It's not seasonally adjusted. Um, so that's giving you an accurate, accurate picture of what's going on with the labor market and it's trending in the other direction. So what happens, let's say, six to eight months from now, we have unemployment of five and a half percent. Do you think that enters the Fed's calculus, and do they pause at that point? Sure, I think that within that time frame, it's entirely likely that the Federal Reserve will start to ease. If you look at a template, which I think there's a chart I've got, which you can look at, which compares this tightening cycle with what happened during Y2K, we're actually exactly on track. Uh, the tightening is sharp, rather like Y2K, but when the Federal Reserve turned, it basically turned. Uh, if I recall, around the end of 2001, and what you can figure that is like 2023, you're going to see quite a sharp uh, pickup in Fed liquidity injections. Now, the only question is that that may take a little bit of time to actually filter into the market. And it may be that you're thinking about uh, a stock market response by maybe Q2 of next year. So we're looking at some time. I mean, the Federal Reserve has got to get its balance sheet down before it gets it up again. But at the end of the day, what we're in is a cycle of QE and QT. And way back at the time of the 2008 crisis, we made what, you know, what appeared to be a heroic a, a, a statement or assumption then to say that, look, this is not just a one-off QE. You're going to start seeing QEs like a bottle of pills. Okay, One is labeled QE1, the next one's QE2, QE3. Central banks are here for the long term. And what investment managers have got to realize uh, you know, as a heads up for this is that the Federal Reserve and central banks have in this game for the long term. You know, if you look at the projections that the New York Fed makes, long-term projections about what the SOMA account, which is the system open market account that the Fed uses to purchase treasuries, that account is going up to seven trillion again uh, within the next five or six years. Okay. Uh, it may go down to five or six in the near term, but they fully expect it to pick up again. So central banks are in the markets long term. If you fear markets are distorted by central bank action, well, welcome to the new world. They're here for good. So 
in the last Fed meeting, they it, with the directive, they issued the dot plot. And on the dot plot, the highest dot on the dot plot was three and a half percent Fed funds, which I believe was like one year out. That was the highest dot. And today we have terminal Fed funds at about three point eight four percent. OK, mm -hmm. so obviously the market thinks that, you know, and that was the highest dot on the dot plot. Um, if you had to guess what terminal Fed funds would be, what do you think it would be? Three percent. Three percent. Yeah, I think they're going to get they're going to get nowhere near uh the the expectations that the market has i just don't think they can push rate increases through uh fast or aggressively enough uh without deriding the economy because what you've got to remember at the same time is they're actually shrinking the balance sheet and the balance sheet shrinkage means a lot, lot more in terms of the stability of the financial system as well so these two factors combined you're going to start to see a very significant recession unfolding and the federal reserve will get spooked so inflation may well come down but I think people are asking, with all due respect, the wrong question on inflation. It's not when inflation peaks that is the key thing. It's when inflation comes back to a sustainable level. And what we've got now is a lot of persistence in the inflation rate. If you do very simple calculations of US inflation, you'll see that the pass through from month to month is up at the same clip that it was at when Volcker came into the Fed in 1978. Uh, you know, he came in to kill inflation. And he did that. But you've got to remember that Volcker created two recessions in three years to get there. OK, uh, j Powell is probably not a Volcker, but he's treading a similar path. But the Fed is going to try and break the system. That, that's what it's uh, that's what it, it's, that's what it typically does. It needs to get inflation down. It can't act on supply. It can only act on demand. And that's what it's focused on. And I'm absolutely sure you're going to get a, a recession in the US. But believe me, the recession in the rest of the world may well be a lot worse uh, because the dollar is going up at the same time. And uh, that's that's not good for international borrowers. Well, from a trading standpoint, you know, I'm looking at March Fed funds right now, March of 2023. They're trading at 9626, so 374. So if you think that terminal Fed funds is going to be three percent, those would be a screaming buy for sure. Yeah, I think. I think that's and, right. And with tens at about 330 right now, I mean, if you think there's going to be a recession, the long end should rally pretty significantly. You know, I think tens would get to two and a half, two and a quarter, something like that. That should also be a screaming buy. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I'd be, I'd lean more towards the funds market for the simple reason: what you've got are two headwinds, which are very unpredictable. One is Japan, uh, and the other is eurozone. Now, if you start to look at, let's look at the eurozone because that's a basket case. But it's easier to to think about. What you've got in the Eurozone is basically uh, a fragile and unstable system, okay? It was designed by politicians, and that's always a mistake. The problem with the Eurozone is fundamentally this, that Italy, to take one example, accumulates debt, okay? It can't avoid accumulating debt. Uh, it's got steep structural problems. And Germany spends all the time denying the liability for that debt, okay? In between, you've got the European Central Bank, the ECB, who will pumping liquidity to paper over those cracks. The COVID-19 emergency gave them the excuse to paper over a lot of cracks, and they pumped in a lot of liquidity, and you avoided fragmentation in the Eurozone bond markets. Effectively, they could buy across the board bonds, and they could pull spreads in. If you get a different regime where you've got to protect financial stability in an environment of rising inflation, good luck with that. Uh, because if they're going to have to tighten, they can't maintain spreads and you'll get fragmentation in the Eurozone. And the fundamental problem that the Eurozone has is there is no safe asset okay, outside of the Bund. And if you look at what the Bund is doing now, it's not behaving very well. So these other bond markets uh, are in a really, really difficult situation. How the ECB gets out of this, I just don't know. It can be a very, very serious problem unless the euro weakens substantially, which I think is a high risk, and or inflation picks up. And inflation picking up may not be acceptable to Northern Europe. So that's the European situation. You know, as they say, uh, you, know, the, uh, the, uh, you know, the Irish joke about travellers, you know, a lost traveller. If you want to get to Dublin, I wouldn't be starting from here. And that's, that's the problem a lot of central banks have got. They made a mistake uh, five or 10 years ago when they basically mistook structurally low cost inflation coming out of China because of China's entry into the World Trade Organization for monetary deflation. 
And what they did is they slashed interest rates, fearing monetary deflation, when in actual fact, what they're looking at was cost deflation. And they should have done nothing. They should have actually kept rates relatively moderately high. As they slashed interest rates, what did you get? You got this avalanche of debt accumulation or mountain of debt accumulation. You mix my metaphors. You got this mountain of debt accumulation. What we've got in the world economy now is $300 trillion worth of debt. The average life of that debt is five years. So simple math says that you're going to have to roll 60 trillion of debt every year, okay, as that debt matures. That's an awesome amount of money. Now, we're told by economists um, and central bankers that the financial systems are new financing systems. They're all about raising capital. Wrong. They're about refinancing debt now. So the debt load, the debt burden on the markets are six times the new capital issuance. Okay, So you're rolling at least 60 trillion of debt every year, but you're only delivering about 10 trillion of new issuance, which is about half global capital spending. So capital markets are actually refinancing mechanisms, not new financing mechanisms. Now, if you're in a new financing mechanism, interest rates matter. But if you're in a refinancing mechanism, hey, it's all about liquidity and balance sheet. You know, from your trading standpoint, you understand that, that this is key, market debt. You want capacity. And if you can't get the capacity, you get problems. And the issue is that the central banks are now controlling balance sheet capacity in the financial system by their movements in their balance sheets. So what the Federal Reserve is basically is now hooked on expanding its balance sheet over a longer term to increase financial capacity. And so these wobbles or these cycles in central bank liquidity, which are being triggered by inflation concerns, are going to cause whopping great cycles in financial markets. And that's what we're facing. It'll rebound again. Look, I'm saying to people, you know, don't sit on the sidelines now. But hey, there's a fantastic opportunity in 2023 to make an awful lot of money here. Uh, but don't you don't want to you know burn your powder now because there's a problem. Markets are going down. You still got a big correction. I mean, we put a a chart in uh, a little bit later in the in the presentation. I think I sent, which is looking at the average S and P 500 performance index performance uh, against U.S. liquidity. Now, if you look at that, there's a very clear relationship, and this data goes all the way back to 1970, and it looks at an average cycle. And what it says is that you've got to expect from peak to trough a, over a 30% drop in the market. And that's a normal correction with a liquidity squeeze and a recession, and that's what we're getting. Okay, first leg down 25%, 10% rebound, second leg down another 17%. Okay, then you start to get some big upswings 27% bounce from the bottom pause, then another 15% up. And these are the sort of things, magnitudes you've got to start thinking about as to how the cycle will unfold. And what turns the market is the Federal Reserve coming back and starting to ease aggressively. Now, I think you're right, Jared, that what's going to happen is the unemployment number is going to spook politicians and bankers uh, come early 2023. And they're going to turn around. They're going to start uh, picking up a bottle of QE pills again and downing them. And that's what we've got. But, you know, the U.S. is one country here. It's a big and important country. But you've got to start thinking about what's happening elsewhere in the world, what's happening in China. Now, the, the, the straightforward way we try and analyze this is to say, look, you've got two moving parts in the stock market. You've got the P.E. and you've got the E. Well, who dominates the P.E.? That's the Federal Reserve. OK, the Federal Reserve uh, you know, crimps money. The P.E. will derate. The P.E. will drop. But if China starts to squeeze, China's footprint in the world economy is enormous, as we know. That will kill the E. So what you're getting at the moment is, you know, uh, is both is both areas. You're getting the P going down because the Fed's tightening aggressively, and you're also getting the E potentially going down. It hasn't really happened a lot yet, but it will do uh, because China is squeezing as well. And look at some of the numbers that were coming out of uh, Target and Walmart uh, a week or ten days ago. They're talking about inventory levels up 30 or 40%. I think Abercrombie was up 25%. These are big, big numbers. And you're talking about you know, recession coming and earnings getting absolutely crunched here. Uh, China is tightening. And why is China tightening? Because the yuan is very weak. And why is the yuan weak? Because of what's happening in Japan. And what you've got is the yen is weakening substantially. The Korean won has gone with the yen. That's weakened too. And that's putting huge pressure 
on the Chinese yuan. Consequently, the People's Bank of China are tightening. Now, normally in April and May of a, of a calendar year, the Chinese People's Bank normally dishes in huge amounts of liquidity into the Chinese markets. That's their seasonal pattern. What did they do the last two months? They took out 800 billion yuan, $120 billion. I mean, this is not a central bank that's easing, believe me. And that's going to have detrimental effects on the Chinese economy. And that's going to be through. I saw some comments out of the BOJ, I guess it was last night or this morning, saying they're concerned about the weakness in the end. Do you think there's, I mean, do they, what do you think is going to happen there? Well, I think they are concerned. But look, I mean, my reckoning is that since early March, in the 40 trading days, since early March to early May, the Japanese yen devalued at an annualized rate of 83%, right? Now, you're a market expert. Have you ever seen a major currency do anything like that? Markets don't do that to currencies. Governments do. This must have been a deliberate ploy. Now, either it was the Japanese thinking they could sneak a devaluation in, but then it's mysterious that the US Treasury have not called foul here, um, or there is some ploy that this is essentially the yen is a Trojan horse, which is basically trying to put a lot of pressure on the Chinese economy and the Chinese yuan. And maybe that's the, the policy. But what they want to do is to destabilize uh, Asian currency markets because China has basically been fixated on stabilizing the yuan for much of the last five years. And this puts a huge amount of pressure on the Chinese economy. Going back to Europe, um, you know, it's funny your comments. I, I, I haven't really heard anybody talk about um, fragmentation in Europe since really 11 years ago, back to 2011. Mm -hmm. And, you know, using your words, you said that they basically papered over the problem over time um, through, you know, debt monetization. But is this something we're going to be hearing more about in the next six months? Um, uh, yeah, I think may maybe maybe in the next in the next six weeks. I mean, I think this is this is a, a big problem because as soon as the ECB starts tightening, and they're slated to raise rates next month, uh, and then again in September, they're slated to start shrinking their balance sheet aggressively uh, from the end of this month. So what you've got is uh, potentially a lot of problems out there for the Eurozone. And you, you, the problems won't go away because on top of that, you've got a little problem called Russia um, and energy. Now, you know Europe has got uh, a serious problem about where it gets its energy from in the long term. And these are structural issues that, you know, sadly, the politicians are probably not even capable of addressing. So I would not want a lot of exposure to Europe at all. Um, <laughs> and I certainly wouldn't want any exposure to the euro. I mean, the, the dollar here is, is going up. And this you think is the, what the administration wants. You think the euro goes below parity? Sure. Yeah. We're not far off now. Yeah. I think it, uh, absolutely. There's no way they can hold this up. Um, getting back to the Fed and the yield curve, um, actually, let's talk about the Fed meeting this week. I mean, I, I think this is probably going to air like after the Fed meeting. So we, you know, that it'll be a little bit stale. Um, do you think the Fed goes 50 or 75? Well, I think the, I, I think the, the, the rule the Fed's got is it basically, you know, uh, it alerts the market to what it wants to do. And it's currently talking about 50. Uh, I'd be surprised of a 75. I think you may be seeing a few 50s, you know, back to back, but I'd be surprised if they go for a 75 because that would be a shock. They may. But at the end of the day, you know, my view is that what really matters is the size of the balance sheet. And I go back to, you know, the chart that I, you probably got there, which is just looking at the pattern of the Federal Reserve net liquidity injections and uh, the market. Now, one of the things I think just to pull out of that, which is a decent heads up to think about is that it's not the size of the balance sheet per se that really matters. It's the effective balance sheet. In other words, the liquidity creating parts of the balance sheet, uh, or in other words, what the Federal Reserve injects into US money markets. That's already dropped by a trillion dollars since December 15th of last year. And December 15th was interesting because it was the, it was the first meeting after Jay Powell's reappointment. It was after two really ugly prints uh, on, I mean, strong employment, I'd say an ugly print, but uh, also an ugly print on consumer prices. And it's when they dropped the transitory narrative. Um, and what you had 
I've had since then in the last six months is a trillion dollars out of the effective Fed balance sheet, not the stated one, not the published one, but the effective one. In other words, US money markets have lost a trillion dollars. And that's why the market's gone down. If the Fed takes another trillion out, it's going down again. If they take two trillion out, it's going down even more. And the pattern is they may take, may have to take out another two trillion. So this is the danger that market that equity investors face. Uh, it's not a great situation. Go back to look at what happened in Japan um, in you know in 1989, 1990. This was a bubble that was burst by uh, by the Bank of Japan getting really tough. This is what the Federal Reserve is doing again now. Similar with Y2K. What you're going to face in a in a sell off a bear market is vicious rallies. Now somebody else calculates that by memory serves me correctly, that in the 84% drop in NASDAQ from peak to trough, there were, uh, I think it was 10 days where the market rallied by an average more than 25% a day, right? <laughs> that's, you know, that's a scary thought, but it still went down 84% from peak to trough. So it's, you know, it's a trader's delight probably, but this is a problem with bear markets. It sounds to me like you're of the belief that you could build just a simple one factor model with changes in liquidity against the S&P and you have a pretty good predictive model of the S&P. Well, it's not it's not always I, I wish it were as simple as that. Uh, unfortunately not, Jared. And the you know the the reality is that you know liquidity mat matters at certain times and at other times it's important but it's not the overriding factor. And what matters right now, particularly when you're squeezing is liquidity. And that's the key. For the last two years, or three three years since the COVID crisis, when QE was abundant, um, it mattered for the market. Uh, now that QT is happening, it matters. So there are certain occasions, certain characteristics. But what I'm saying is that investment managers have got to start looking at liquidity. It's a key variable to look at. Don't just look at earnings or valuations, look at liquidity. And in the long term, we know from what the New York Fed has been is telling us uh, you know, in black and white, that the central banks are going to be here for the long term. They are in the financial system. They are big and they are they are big banks, effectively, creating credit, uh, underpinning the system. You've got to pay attention to what the Fed's doing. Uh, when we talked last week, you, you said that this is a very normal bear market. And I was a little bit surprised. First of all, all bear markets are different in their own way. Um, but I guess what you meant by that was, it's it's a withdrawal of liquidity and the S&P goes down 20 or 30% and it's it's a garden variety bear market. I think I think what makes what makes this one unique is that uh the Fed is tightening but it can't possibly tighten enough to completely eliminate inflation or get it down to 2% because of all the leverage in the system, because of our sensitivity to interest rates. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think I, I think that's right. I mean, if, if I said it, I probably did say it's a fairly average bear, bear market. I think I was, I was thinking much more of the fixed income markets at that stage. But, uh, you know, if, if, I, if it was related to equities, maybe I was just being a bit flippant there. But, you know, for which I apologize. But the, uh, but the point is, if you look at the fixed income markets, it's a very, very normal cycle. And you know, if you if there's a chart, I think I, I I put in or sent over, which is which is looking at how the fixed income markets have responded this time. And there's a chart which looks at uh, you know one factor is the expected or terminal rate on Fed funds, which you referred to earlier on, Jared, uh, which shows the spike up to I've got in the chart about three point six since Friday. It's gone to what is it three point eight? Uh, and the other factor, the other decomposition or the other part of that, which is the implied term premium. On the uh, on the ten year bond now that's a slightly wonkish concept, but a term premium reflects the excess demand or excess supply uh, for treasuries. Now what you've seen is not just the Fed funds rate spike or implied Fed funds rate spike, you've also seen term premium collapse at the long end. Now those two things together give a really bearish message for the credit markets. Now the reason to come back and explain that, which is as I said, somewhat wonkish point. But it's important. It's an important thing to understand. If you go back to the time when I was when I worked at Salomon Brothers, the the U.S. investment bank, a big trading firm, Salomon was key in the in the fixed income markets, as you probably recall. And what the traders there used to fear more than anything else was not so much an inverted curve, but
got a flat curve with a big belly on it, okay? In other words, that you had yields around the mid-duration area, which was higher than either the front end or the back end. Now, what that basically told you were two things were happening, and that's spelt out in the chart that I'm showing, which is looking at uh, terminal Fed funds rate or implied Fed funds and the term premium. The term premium measures the back end of the curve. And what the term premium is saying is what is the appetite of the market for risky debt? So if that term premium collapses, what it's telling you is there is heightened demand for safe assets in the system, i.e. US 10-year treasury bonds, right? What the front end is telling you is the steepness is that the cost of capital, uh, particularly for a corporate who is financing in the three to five year area, is becoming hugely more expensive. So what you've got now is two things going on. You've got the cost of capital going up enormously for corporates. And we know there's a lot of refinancing that's got to take place. And the second factor is that the back end is collapsing. So the appetite for that debt is just evaporating fast. So good luck with getting any corporate issues away because it's going to be really tough. And look at the look at the new issue market for the last few months. It's been dead, right? It's going to get worse, believe me. There was a headline in the Financial Times a few weeks ago, three maybe three weeks ago, which said, you know, liquidity is terrible. And this was traders talking about how the depth of the mini S&P futures contract had just evaporated. It had collapsed by 70% uh, since pre-COVID times. Now, these are big, big moves. Liquidity is draining from the system. And this is the worry. So for the credit markets, you've got an upcoming problem. Now, there's another chart, a subsequent chart that I showed which is looking at a very simple relationship between an index of credit spreads, which shows the rally in uh, or as rally, the increase in credit spreads that you're getting right now, alongside the 10-5 yield curve, treasury yield curve spread inverted. Uh, and what that basically shows is the credit cycle is likely to worsen significantly. And that's the reality. That's what's going to spook the Federal Reserve. But believe me, it's coming. And if you get this occurring, you're going to start to get a recession in the US. And I think a recession, as I said, is maybe a couple of months off. Europe's already in recession, I think. Asia's already there. It's just the US, which has basically got to, got to catch up with the others. But I think it's coming, sadly. Well, the rule of thumb with credit is that, you know, if you, if you, just, if you backtested this, if you bought high yield any time it got to a spread of 700 over, you generally had pretty good returns. And I think we're almost there. I think high yield is almost there, um, although I haven't looked at it. So um, I, you know, I'm always looking for opportunities to get involved in high yield and preferreds and stuff like that. Um, when do you think is the right time in the cycle to do that? Well, I think there may, there may be a little bit of pressure yet, yeah, but I think from in, in terms of a total return, given the cushion you've got in spreads, you may be absolutely right. Um, and given the fact that a lot of these high yield bonds are not particularly high duration or long duration. So it's it's quite possible that from a total return point of view, you could actually come out on top. I, I'm not going to deny that. The optimal time to buy, I would still think, is a few months away because we haven't really had the credit distress yet. But I think, as I say, I think that's coming. Uh, is it correct to buy the treasury market yet? I think it's time to put a toe in the water. I mean, I think around about the 3, 3.2%. Uh, percent area for uh, long dated treasuries, 10 year treasuries is probably not a bad buying time. Uh, but I could be wrong. And I think I'd be wrong on the basis that the Japanese end yield curve control or modify it because they are spooked by the yen, which you alluded to, that's possible. They could push it up by another 25 basis points. But I think that could be in the create an earthquake in the offshore market. So there's a question there. Uh, that could, you know, who knows what effect that will have on treasuries, maybe initially bad, but it could easily come back and be good in the longer term, as the Asian crisis was in 97. Uh, and then you've got the problem in Germany with the Bund under a lot of um, pressure, down, Bund price under down pressure. So I think there are issues there, but I think we're getting very close to the point where you could buy, um, you know, you could buy high yield, as you rightly say, uh, and you could buy quality US treasuries. Uh, at the end of the day, the bond markets have got to rally first before the equity market turns. And we're not at that point yet. Yeah. Uh, we actually haven't talked about gold yet. And um, it, it's funny because 
if the playbook for bear market going all the way back to the 70s was if you thought that there was going to be a dislocation or a crash or a bear market, uh, you would buy gold, you would buy T-bills, and gold was a flight to safety asset. And just looking at today, it's a mess. Uh, it, and it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, it ran up to 2060 before or around the time of the Ukraine invasion and it collapsed. Uh, it's actually, you know, year to date, it's still up. It's outperformed just about everything else, but uh, certainly, you know, not what you would expect going into a bear market. Yeah, I, I figure that's right. I mean, I think the, the issue is that with central banks tightening aggressively, gold is a monetary phenomenon and it's going to face a lot of headwinds. Okay. From a longer term perspective, if you believe in monetary inflation, gold is a fantastic hedge against monetary inflation. There's no question about that in the longer term, but only in the longer term. If the central banks are tightening and creating monetary deflation, then you've got a problem with gold, which is what we've got right now. But I think that as it happens, uh, central banks are in the business of creating monetary inflation, as I alluded to. They're going to be here for the long term, expect monetary inflation. That's not high street inflation. Gold has never been uh, a great hedge against high street inflation, only monetary inflation. And I think you've got to throw into that same basket crypto. And I think the best way to think about this is to think of crypto and gold together. Uh, crypto has been a much more sensitive asset to monetary inflations and monetary deflations than gold has. But it, they're just, it's just a higher beta version of the same phenomenon. Now, you know, crypto is getting hammered right now, for sure. But that's because you've got a monetary squeeze going on, and it likely will go down further. But at the end of the day, uh, I think that both crypto and gold are very good long-term monetary hedges for investors. It's just that I wouldn't want to own them right this moment. <laughs> uh, all right. I got one last question. So when we talked over the weekend, you, you said that you wanted to play the markets negatively for the next three to six months. And let's just say six months. So over the course of the next six months, we'll have four Fed meetings, four 50 basis point hikes, which takes us to 275. At that point, we'll probably have unemployment up to four and a half. Um, you know, maybe stocks are down 25 to 30 percent from the highs. So what happens after six months? So you play them negatively for the three for three to six months. But what's the playbook after that? Then I, gotta, then I think you've got to start thinking about reentering markets. I say think about it. I think you've just got to look at the dynamics to ask the question, you know, is the Federal Reserve set to be turning? Um, what sort of value have you got in stocks or uh, other financial assets? Have you got a compelling case, a compelling value case, uh, which you may well have by that stage? And if you get that value case ignited by some monetary accommodation, then markets are going to zoom as they've done before. Uh, you know, the, the, the thing is that you've, you know, you've got cycles. And uh, uh, as somebody very rightly said, I think it was a, a, a guy on Twitter, Michael Gayed, who does the legal ag report, he said, look, there are no gurus out there. Are there any cycles? I think, you know, never was a truer statement said. This is absolutely right. It's all about cycles. And who's driving the cycles are the central banks. And increasingly, it's the Federal Reserve that's in the driving seat. And I think that, you know, you've got to think about this in a general sense, that the Fed Treasury uh, policy is to get the balance sheet down and get the dollar up. And both of those are inflation uh, cures in the longer term. And both of them, if you like, increase the dominance of America within the world economy. Effectively, what you're looking at, as has happened many times before, you're just sucking dollars back into the US. Uh, that's going to be the, the start of a new bull market. But it's not now. It's maybe six months time. But the interesting thing about the interesting thing about, you know, raising rates, fighting inflation, getting the dollar up is that you're really doing so at the expense of the rest of the world. Right. Yeah. I think that's right. Yeah. But then, you know, go, go read Janet Yellen's speech called Friendshoring, um, which was published, I think, in early April, where she gave a speech to the Atlantic Council and then listened to Blinken's subsequent statement about China. What, what America is saying is that we've got friends and we've got foes. OK, Friendshoring is all about sharing trade and capital and dollars to our friends, but the foes don't get anything. And I think that sort of plays back into this whole argument that many people have aired about, is this Bretton Woods 3? Is it Bretton Woods 2? Whatever. Don't no, forget it. It's not. This is nothing like that. Okay, This is not another iteration. 
This is Bretton Woods one. We haven't left the old system. What was Bretton Woods one? What Bretton Woods one all about? It was about dollar dominance. It was about essentially creating an international system that grew out of the disruption and autarky of the of World War Two. Okay, and it basically meant you could move capital and trade around the free world. Okay, now let me emphasize the free world because the Soviet bloc and China were outside of that. Well, welcome to the, the new world. We're back where we were. We're back into Bretton Woods 1. It so happened that people characterized Bretton Woods 1 as a fixed exchange rate system. Well, forget that. That, that was, a, that was a, 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 an aside. It's all about putting the dollar at the centerpiece of the world economy, having the IMF and the World Bank to police international stability, and moving capital and trade around the free world. We never left Bretton Woods 1. We're still there. The dollar is still dominant. In fact, it's got even more dominant, despite what economists have been claiming for much of the last 20, 30 years that it was about to fade. Dollar is all powerful. And the Federal Reserve, which lost power prior to the 2008 crisis, has muscled back in. And the Fed is very much in the driving seat now. Cool. Michael, thanks for the talk today. I really enjoyed talking with you. And uh... Great pleasure. Hope to see it again at a conference or something, or I don't know, but I do hope to, I hope to meet you in person someday. Good. Look out for it, Joe. Thanks. Thanks. Take care. Hey there, revolutionaries. To join a community sharing insights like you just watched, head over to realvision.com. There you will get unbiased insights and exclusive access to the very best, brightest, and biggest names in finance. Be a part of our community of lifelong learners. See you there.